right, everyone. Okay, so let's start the afternoon session. Thank you for holding on, and uh, hope you uh, enjoyed the lunch. And uh, let's move on with the uh, afternoon sessions, which include specific uh, illnesses uh, that will involve uh, different parts of GI tract. Uh, and um, and you'll see how different they are. That's that's a fascinating thing about microbiome dependent uh, diseases. So without further ado, uh, our next speaker is Dr. Mark Pimentel. Um, those who follow microbiome field um, know Dr. Pimentel. He's is a legend in that field. Uh, going back uh, 25 years, he was talking about uh, the microbiome uh, at the time that nobody would even think that that's, that's a thing. Uh, so now, uh, here we are uh, in, a, in, a, in a field that you saw how many thousands of publications that Dr. Mathur was showing uh, that are being published every year in that field. So that vision of Mark has changed the lives of many and a management of the disease, and it essentially flipped the field on its head, uh, and it's a privilege to have him today. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is, if, I, if this goes post-infectious IBS, road to a cure. What I'm gonna try to do is take you through the journey and the story, and you'll hear a little bit of overlap between my talk and Dr. Nasser's talk after me because I'm trying to show you how you get to SIBO, how you get to that point, and, and what, the, what the circumstances are. But I do wanna go and start in 1996, which is what IBS used to be thought of when we first, you know, when I first started my fellowship, for example. So IBS circa 1996, no FDA approved drugs for IBS that early life trauma, anxiety, depression, and that IBS is a female disease, which is a really derogatory term, not to mention the term at the bottom, IBS is a disease of hysterical women. This is literally what a doctor said uh, on a podium. So these, these are bad things to say. This is not true. This is not what IBS is. It is now, we believe, an organic disease. But this is, these are the therapies we had. So if you had diarrhea, well, take an anti-diarrheal. That's it. Solve the problem. If you had constipation, take a laxative, solve the problem. But never sort of thinking about, well, how do you treat the cause? What's the cause? If you treat the cause, they get really better, not just me. I always say in my uh, talks, diarrhea is not a treatment for constipation, and constipation is not a treatment for diarrhea, because that's just making you the opposite, and bad in the opposite direction. So uh, I think that's, that's the point of this slide, is to say we've come a long way. What we do think is happening now, 26, 27 years later, is that food poisoning starts this whole thing. So whether it's E. coli or, Klebs or, e. coli or Campylobacter or Shigella or Salmonella, and when I say E. coli, I mean the pathogenic types of E. coli that you might get on a, on a vacation somewhere or eating bad food. And they all share one toxin in common, cytolethal distending toxin, which I will speak to at length, because that's what's causing, we believe, autoimmunity in people. And that autoimmunity is to particular nerves of your gut, which I'm gonna show you the pictures of, and then the gut doesn't move well. The gut's cleaning waves that Dr. Rezai showed earlier, which sort of sets up this whole story, they don't work. And when they don't work, you don't get cleaning. And then the debris from the food from last night by breakfast, your bowel's not clean. If it's not clean, the bacteria are gonna build up, hence overgrowth. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. But let's start with these bookends. We didn't know all about this back uh, 25, 26 years ago, but now in 2017, this is a study from the Mayo Clinic, first author is Clem, and what we find in this is that if you look at outbreaks, so if you study, there was an outbreak in Spain where a thousand people got salmonella food poisoning and they followed them right after that. And they found that these patients developed irritable bowel syndrome. Well, if you take all those kinds of studies and mash them together, really, if you go to a wedding, 100 people go to a wedding, everybody gets food poisoning because the buffet had, you know, Campylobacter in it, 11 people after that will have IBS for an indefinite period of time which is huge, it's a, it's a significant number of people. And so we now know, point of fact, that food poisoning causes IBS. So let me just pause there for a second because if you think about the term irritable bowel syndrome, 
it's a very derogatory term for patients because I am saying that you are irritable, which feeds into the whole thing that it's a irritable patients, okay? That it's a bowel disorder, which is nobody wants to talk about their bowels, and that it's a syndrome, which means you're not a disease, you're not legit, you're a syndrome of, or a constellation of symptoms. And that's delegitimizing the patient. So the terminology doesn't make sense. But here we are, we know the cause of IBS in a certain percentage, it's food poisoning. We don't even know this for Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. We don't know what causes Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, but because there's blood in the stool, oh, that's a serious disease and all this. But we now know more about IBS based on this, this one slide about what caused it, and yet it's still a syndrome. So a little frustrating, frustrating for me, frustrating for patients, but I just want to make that point. But can food poisoning cause overgrowth, which is the theory we think that IBS, 60% of IBS is overgrowth? And the answer is yes. So this was a study we did a long way back, 2008. Rats got Campylobacter. The other rats didn't. And then we looked to see what happened, and the rats who got Campylobacter ended up with SIBO. Not only did they have SIBO in 27% of the rats, the rats who got Campylobacter, which is the C-positive, who developed SIBO, they had weird bowel function. They had wet stool. So for the first time in history, we have an animal model of post-infectious irritable bowel syndrome. So what do you do with animal models? You study what's going on, and you try and figure out what, what exactly is A, B, C, D, and E, IBS, you know, the, 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 the steps. But if you think Campylobacter, you know, people don't believe that it causes IBS, that's pretty much done now, 26 years later, because there's this study. Uh, we were part of this, Will Takakura's now at Michigan. He worked with us for a while. This is the Bradford Hill criteria. So what does that mean? It means that this is the strict criteria that are used to show cause and effect in the infectious disease world. So if you want to say tuberculosis causes lung disease, now the rigorous criteria are the Bradford Hill criteria. Well, Campylobacter causes IBS meets all the Bradford Hill criteria. So we now know in 2022, full stop again, IBS in part is caused by food poisoning, and in this case, Campylobacter. But how does it work? And so one of the things that we now know is that four different organisms, you can see them on the, focus on the left first, you've got four different organisms, you've got Campylobacter, you've got Salmonella, uh, Shigella, E. coli. They're different, and you, you heard that from Dr. Leite's lecture this morning. These organisms are different, they have different staining, they have different kind of uh, um, functionality. And so how can all four of these cause IBS? Well, it turns out they have one toxin in common when they're pathogenic, and that's the CDTB toxin. So we did a series of experiments, and this is now a decade's worth of work I'm going to summarize in literally just a handful of slides, that we were able to cut that gene out of the Campylobacter, and the rats didn't get IBS. And then we had to find out, well, why is the CDTB toxin causing IBS? And we found out that the CDTB toxin has a sequence in it, a gene sequence, that's a protein sequence that's very similar to your own protein called vinculin. And so the next slide is a very complicated slide, but it took a lot of work to pull down and figure out what exactly CDTB looks like in you. And we did that over many, many years in this paper. But I'll show you what vinculin is because you need to understand this. So these are cells. This is a cell here, this is another cell here. The blue is the nucleus of the cell, and the green are the skeleton of your cells to keep the cell shaped. At the end of the lines of the skeleton is a motor, this red part, and it's a complex of four or five proteins that form like a motor that moves out so the cells can stretch out and grab onto each other. And the vinculin is part of this motor complex at the end of these strings helping cells attach. And the particular vinculin that you get autoimmunity to is present in the nerves of the gut and in the, the lining of the intestine or the skin. And so that's a really important factor when it comes to how this causes IBS or makes IBS worse. So essentially, if you have high antibodies to vinculin, 
it's sort of like half the house doesn't have lights because the wires don't quite reach the light bulb. So if they don't quite reach the light bulb because the, the, the fingers or the lines of the nerves aren't attaching, you get less light. And less light in this context means less migrating motor complexes. So these are the lights. Uh, these are the, uh, the nerves. These nerves, this is the normal tissue. These are the nerves that cause the cleaning wave in your gut. And they have to be a lot of these nerves, and they're all interconnected. You can't see the lines, but they're interconnected. Focus on this one, which is this panel. These are the nerves in the rats who got Campylobacter who now have SIBO. They are barely visible. They're not there. So you get less cleaning waves. So the next question is, do IBS patients with overgrowth have less cleaning waves? Well, we actually knew that in, in 2002, but look at this. This is the cleaning wave. Dr. Razai showed you an example of a cleaning wave. This is a little more bold example because it's blown up, but you can see how beautiful this is. So when you wake up in the morning and you hear that growling sound and you're like, oh my gosh, I should eat something because I'm gonna embarrass myself in front of other people, don't. This has to come. This is a beautiful thing. It's supposed to clean your small bowel and keep it free of debris so that the overgrowth doesn't come back. But look how aggressive this is. Nothing in the upper gut looks this aggressive. This is a, a really an important function of the gut. But look what happens in IBS with SIBO. This is a normal person, how many cleaning waves they get. And look here. But look at this. 50% of irritable bowel syndrome patients with SIBO, we couldn't find even one. So it's gone, or at least it's gone for the time that we're measuring it for the six hours. And so the cleaning waves aren't working. And we now know since 1977, no cleaning waves, you get SIBO. This is not a new, this is not news. This is 1977. It's almost 50 years old information. So I'm put, starting to get the story together that this toxin is leading to this antibody that's causing the damage to the nerves of the gut and then this bacterial overgrowth part of the story. But if you really want to prove that CDTB, that toxin, is causing the problem, then forget about Campylobacter, forget about Shigella, Salmonella, all that stuff. Just give the toxin. Will it make overgrowth? Will it make IBS? So we did that. We gave the toxin like a vaccine to rats. And then we gave them a booster three weeks later, just like your COVID shot. Three weeks later, you get the second shot. And so these, ant these rats got a bunch of CDTB antibodies. So they got immune to CDTB really fast and really strongly. But we never gave them vinculin. They got antibodies to vinculin. So giving the toxin made the rats form antibodies to vinculin, which means we're inducing autoimmunity by just giving this toxin. And I know this is a complicated slide, but the rats got overgrowth both in the duodenum and the ileum. And so by doing this process of the CDTB causing all that damage, you get overgrowth in these rats. So it kind of works like this. You get food poisoning. This toxin gets secreted into you and you react. You form antibodies. You don't like this toxin. You don't like any of it. You don't like this part. You don't like this part. You don't like this part. But this part purposefully looks a little like that. And as a result, you get autoimmunity to vinculin. So I'm going to show you some really technical slides, but it's not hard to understand. We did the experiment again. The rats got Campylobacter, the CDTB toxin again. Antibodies go up. The stool water goes up because they're getting diarrhea. And the more the antibodies are up, the more watery their stool is. So the worse these antibodies are in a person's blood, in a rat's blood, the worse they are. But look what happened to the rats. They got SIBO, but they got two types of SIBO, two different types. They, some of the rats, like at the wedding, some people recover completely. So the orange is the control group. This is their microbiome. The green is rats who went to the wedding, got the CDTB toxin because they got food poisoning, but no problem, they did okay. But then the group that didn't do okay broke down into two distinct groups. We call them microtypes. One is too much E. coli, which is hydrogen producer. Another is desulfovibrio, which is a hydrogen sulfide producer. So why am I telling you all this complicated information? Because in the last three years, we've now defined or identified that SIBO is breaking down 
on the diarrhea side into two subtypes that have to be treated differently. There's the hydrogen type, which is E. coli, and I'll show you that later, and the hydrogen sulfide type, which is different and has to be treated uh, separately. So this was the problem or part of the missing pieces that we didn't have. But as a result, we now have blood test. So if you measure anti-CDTB and anti-vinculin in patients with IBS, you can diagnose that they have IBS. You can diagnose it with 98% post-test probability, which is really, really good. And secondly, medical certainty is over 80%, and compared to everything else in IBS, the new test, the second generation, oops, is way up here. So if you have a blood test, I'm just going to say this again, if you have a blood test that measures something that's the causing the disease or the condition, it can no longer be a syndrome. It's a disease, right? Because you have a biological variable that's abnormal. And so this actually legitimizes patients. Patients actually have a condition. This is real. This is organic. It's not in your head. There's something going on biologically. And so the way it works is you've got this beautiful microbiome. You get Campylobacter. And it's producing all this toxin. You saw these villi in some pictures that Dr. Razai showed earlier. You form antibodies to these toxins. You see the antibodies going up in your bloodstream. But the antivinculin comes later. And when it comes, you form antibodies to the nerves of your gut. You can see the nerves are coming apart. The motility changes, and all these blue guys are the bad guys, the SIBO. And so that's how we think IBS now develops in about 60% of patients. But I wanted to show you this one study, and it's kind of going to overlap a little bit with Jason's talk, so I apologize to Jason for that, but it fits in the narrative here is that this is the first study in history. Breath test has been around for 40 years. This is the first time in history we have a breath test with three gases, hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide. We have the patients with diarrhea and constipation, and we have the microbiome proving that the breath test is working, that it's telling you what's going on in the gut. So these are diarrhea patients, diarrhea IBS. They weren't selected because they had overgrowth. They were put into a study for IBSD for an FDA-approved study. And this group of C patients, IBS constipation patients, were put in from another FDA-approved study. But we did breath tests. And you can see diarrhea patients, no methane, almost ever. Constipated patients, not all of them had methane, but when they did, it looked like this. The interesting part is the diarrhea patients had hydrogen. And this is the cutoff. If I draw a line right here, that's the cutoff for SIBO. And look, the majority of them were above that line, so they had SIBO in diarrhea IBS. But the other kid is hydrogen sulfide, which is definitely elevated compared to the other groups. So you have to know what you have. And we now know. We know the characters. So, so uh, hopefully Jason will cover some of this. But we know who the folks are, who the bugs are that are causing uh, SIBO. One of them for emo, for intestinal methanogen overgrowth, we identified that this is the bug. So we know one bug is causing this condition. It's M. smithii. It's an ar archaea, which uh, was covered earlier, and that it correlates directly with the breath test. So for the first time, we can say the breath test, what number you get, correlates with the number of these bad guys or bad characters in your gut, and that's why you have constipation. So this is a very important study for that reason, and it led us to understand IBS as three distinct groups of microbiome. On the diarrhea side, the hydrogen producers, just like the rats. Hydrogen sulfide producer, just like the rats. And then on the constipation side, this methanobrevibacter, or this methane producer, causing the methane, causing you to be constipated. Well, we now worldwide acknowledge SIBO. This wasn't the case uh, a couple of decades ago. But worldwide, there's now an understanding based on this consensus, European consensus, and Asian consensus that SIBO is important, and it is important in irritable bowel syndrome. So that's really good for you to know. I mentioned that there are three types. There's the hydrogen type, the hydrogen sulfide type, and the methane type. But what I want to emphasize is that hydrogen sulfide is the diarrhea-associated type. So 
In the last few minutes, I, this is the story. I've kind of given you a very quick snapshot. It literally is hours of lecture to go through each of these and show you all the details of how we got to this point. But I gave you sort of the snapshot of it. And we now know what's causing irritable bowel syndrome, and that's 60%. Now, when rifaximin came out, this is the New England Journal paper that uh, validated the two phase three studies for rifaximin. It was a, a bit of a shock because you take a drug for two weeks and you get three months of benefit or longer. And so you are actually treating a cause. Now, it doesn't help every single person, and this is why we have to continue our research because rifaximin doesn't get rid of all SIBO in all patients, maybe in part because of hydrogen sulfide, which we didn't know back then. But what we do know from Dr. Rezai's study is that breath testing does help you because if, you're, if you just blindly give rifaximin, you've got a 44% chance of getting better. But if you know you have SIBO, the chances go up, and a breath test is predicting that happening. Now, methane is a different story. Methanogens are archaea. We, we heard about this. It's a different kingdom of life. Uh, Dr. Mathur mentioned that. Well, we don't have antibiotics for archaea. We have antibiotics for bacteria. So we had to figure out what antibiotics might work for archaea. And it turns out if you combine neomycin and rifaximin, you get a pretty good response to constipation because it makes methane go down better. But we need to do better than this, and we are, and we've got some drugs that we're working with now that we think will supersede this and really get at it. The, the, the most important thing is if you know the bug, you can start working on a treatment. If you know the bug in this category, you can start working on the next treatment, and the same for the third category. So we have the three categories, and if you think we didn't know these three categories two years ago, we did, and, and that because research that we know now doesn't get publicly available until the paper's published. So we know things that are that, uh, already at two years in the future, which I'm telling you the future looks pretty bright. And so bismuth is what we sometimes use for hydrogen sulfide now in our practice. So going back to this, we now know this was not a good template for irritable bowel syndrome. It is not these things per se. I am not saying stress, anxiety, depression don't exacerbate symptoms of heart disease, blood pressure, and all other diseases. What I'm saying is these are not the causes, but they may be cofactors in, in this condition. And if you want to know what, what's known about the microbiome, this pretty much sums up a lot of the information. I'm not going through it, but this is a really uh, sort of a, a summary slide of everything. So in conclusion, uh, irritable bowel syndrome is commonly a small bowel microbiome disease now. SIBO is an important contributor to IBS, and the most important organisms you're going to hear about from Jason are E. coli and Klebsiella. You're going to hear that. So we now know those characters and methanogens. M. smithii is the character that produces methane and constipation. Hydrogen sulfide is the new kid, but it's going to be the most important because it's a direct line to diarrhea. More hydrogen sulfide, more diarrhea. So you've got to get that down. And then these antibodies really make IBS a disease. It's a disease now, not a syndrome. And uh, I don't know when we're going to get rid of, the term, rid of the term syndrome for IBS. But now that we understand all these targets, the path to drug development and treatment is going to change immensely. And, and you'll see that in the coming, um, coming weeks or years or months. Depends, depends on the drug. So um, thank you so much. I'm going to now introduce Jason, Dr. Nasser, who's our uh, motility fellow. He's going to talk about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And we're, we're very grateful to have him in our clinic. And I, I see him every Tuesday. And he's, he's a, a tremendous mind in terms of uh, what we're doing at the center. And I and, uh, hope you'll enjoy his lecture next. Hello, everyone. Um, so that will be a very challenging talk to come after, but fortunately for me, based on everybody else's talks, this talk should come more of a synthesis of everything you've heard so far today. So by the end of this talk, ideally, I would want you to be able to really identify and define SIBO and for you to recognize the symptoms that can be seen with SIBO and be comfortable with that, and also be comfortable with what predisposes you to have SIBO. And then on the second part, understand how we help we diagnose SIBO 
and then how we treat SIBO and maybe some of the things that can be done to prevent it from coming again. So what is SIBO? <clears throat> First, what is normal and where does food go? And as you heard from Dr. Azai's talk, food goes from the mouth through the gut and specific specifically from the stomach to the small intestine to the large intestine. And then what is the normal gut flora? As was mentioned before, the highest concentration that is very normal is in the colon. And that's where a lot of the normal digestion by the, microbi by the microbiota happens. But unlike our colon, the small bowel is relatively sterile. So here you can see that the colon has maybe one trillion bacteria per ml. The mouth has one billion per ml, while the small bowel should only have 1,000 per ml. So it's relatively sterile and has very little bacteria within it. So what is SIBO? SIBO stands for small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It's the dislocation of the bacteria from the colon where they normally should exist in high concentrations and where they migrate up towards the small intestine. In reality, what I would like to highlight is that it's not really an infection. You know, when you get food poisoning, get salmonella, that's an infection. The bug is sort of maybe trying to hurt you. In SIBO, the bugs are not trying to hurt you. They're not secreting a specific toxin that's mediating the symptoms. They're just trying to grow in and of themselves, but coincidentally, they cause symptoms. And this growth is abnormal. And why is it abnormal? How is it abnormal? It's an abnormal in its quantity. So the bacteria proliferate to very high numbers. That's one. Two, they're in the wrong location, right? They're in the small intestine. That's the, where they're proliferating. And the small intestine is narrower in diameter, maybe, maybe more sensitive than the colon. And then finally, in wrong proportions. And as Dr. Pimentel alluded to, especially our lab has recently, um, maybe even not necessarily just recently, has identified exactly what bacteria contribute to this asymmetric growth. And they are specifically E. coli and Klebsiella, both Klebsiella pneumonia and Klebsiella aerogenes. And so it is the asymmetric growth of these bacteria that just proliferate and get too comfortable that causes symptoms. So don't think of it in terms of good bacteria, bad bacteria. It really is just some bacteria that are growing way too much in the wrong place. And they produce the gases that you've heard about today and that I will address in a bit. So on the other hand, what is emo? Because you've heard that abbreviation. It is the intestinal methanogen overgrowth. So methanogens are not technically bacteria. And this gets a bit technical and may seem semantic, but it does have consequences, as you've heard about you know, how we treat it and what symptoms it comes with. And Koka Yip will be speaking about this in details. But also, it is a dysbiosis. It's not an infection. And what is CFO, small intestinal fungal overgrowth? Similarly, this part of the tree of life can proliferate too much in the small bowel. And we think that it has a similar presentation to SIBO, but it is different in, in how we diagnose it. And I'll address that in a bit. But again, it's a dysbiosis. It's not when you have, like when you have fungus in your blood and you're extremely ill. It's just dysbiosis. It's overgrowth of the fungus within your gut. They're just trying to live their best life, but that is inconvenient to us in a way. So what are the symptoms that are associated with SIBO, CIFO, and EMO? I will note that none of them are 100% present. So we can't say, oh, if you're not bloated, you don't have this. Oh, if you don't have diarrhea, you can't have this. Patients come into our clinic with a mixture of these symptoms. You can have abdominal distension, which is when you see your belly sort of bloated, um, or you can visibly see it descended. And then bloating is more so of a subjective feeling. You know, After you finish a meal and you just subjectively feel like you're bloated, um, you can have diarrhea or urgency, which is more common with hydrogen predominant and hydrogen sulfide predominant um, bacteria, which I'll address again in a bit. And then constipation, which is more common in emo. You can have nausea, but vomiting is not a typical aspect of SIBO. You can have abdominal discomfort, abdominal pain, early satiety. You know, you eat a meal that's a small meal and you get full early on. That can be a lot of things, but that can be seen in SIBO. And then fatigue, we get a lot of patients who are just lethargic, fatigued, with brain fog. That can be a lot of things, but one of those things is SIBO. And also weight changes can be seen. And then historically, we've always discussed that you can see nutritional deficiencies, specifically a low vitamin B12 and a high folate. Nowadays, with the, very, with the attention that we have towards SIBO, ideally, we're catching it 
far before this happens. So you don't see it that often. So what drives the symptoms in SIBO? Um, and the circles came in slightly too early. Bacterial fermentation of carbohydrates. So you eat carbs, right? You eat a piece of bread, you eat some rice, and then you have fermentation into carbon dioxide and hydrogen. And then some of the methanogens, the specific subgroup of bacteria uh, of archaea in your gut can produce methane. Some acetogens, which is another just group of bacteria, can produce um, acetate. And then sulfate reducers can produce hydrogen sulfide, and then some can produce ammonia. The ones that are pertinent to this talk are the hydrogen, which is very common with bacteria, the methane, and the hydrogen sulfide. And this is what really drives this, or at least what we believe to drive the symptoms in SIBO, that we think that a lot, especially in methane, we think that these can interact with the body, they can have consequences on motility, and also cause a lot of the distension that is seen in a lot of gas and flatulence. How does this small bowel remain relatively sterile, right? So what is the normal and how, why doesn't everybody have SIBO? Why doesn't this happen more commonly? It's because as Dr. Rosai and more than one person already mentioned, it's the housekeeper waves, which generally occur during the fasting phase and they originate up in the stomach or small bowel. And the way I want you to imagine it, it's sort of like a tide that just keeps everything at bay. Right? It's very hard to swim into the ocean if there's a very strong tide that comes in every now and then. And that's how it is normally. But if you lose the migrating motor complexes, you could just float into the ocean. Another way to think about it is that if, you're the, if your intestines are nor working normally, there should always be a forward force, right? Food goes from up to down. But if, you, and it's like, think of, of as if this man was a, was the gut microbiome, if they try to go up, they shouldn't be able to because there should always be a propulsive force forward. But if you have um, hypomotility of the gut, which is slowing down of the gut, then this escalator, if it stops, it's very easy for this man or this metaphorical bacteria to go up the escalator. And that's one mechanism, but we do believe that that's the predominant mechanism. There are a lot of other smaller mechanisms. One of them is stomach acid. But this has uh, the stomach acid, ha in terms of, obviously, that raises the question of, oh, do proton pump inhibitors raise the risk of SIBO? That has been sort of not very well established. The antibacterial activity of the pancreatic excretions. And then finally, the ileocecal valve. And what that is is basically it's, you know, the small bowel connects to the large bowel, and there's a bit of a valve there. And ideally, if it's, pa if it's in place and intact, it should act as another barrier against bacteria moving upwards. But in some patients, that becomes a weak, uh, the valve becomes weaker or non-existent. Now, what causes SIBO? Now, what has to go wrong aside from that to, that can contribute to causing SIBO? So SIBO is not really a primary disease, as we've discussed. It's hard for the bacteria to proliferate in and of themselves and decide to grow to that extent. We, can see, we see it very often in terms of post-surgical patients, patients who have had any surgeries on their bowel, especially ileocecal resection, which is removal of that valve that I mentioned. You can, we definitely see it there. Adhesions, which can come in from any abdominal surgery. Oh, I had an appendectomy when I was 10. Oh, I had an ovarian torsion surgery. Any surgery can cause it, but also a lot of times infections that can be pretty bad in the gut can cause adhesions even without having had surgery. Like a very bad bout of appendicitis, for example, very possible for it to cause adhesions even without the surgery. Uh, small bowel dysmotility, as we've discussed, there are some specific reasons to have small bowel uh, dysmotility, uh, such as in connective tissue diseases, you can see it, like scleroderma, autoimmune diseases, very common. And then post-infection IBS with the antibodies that were just discussed. Inflammatory, such as patients with Crohn's and in other inflammatory conditions, or patients with a surf radiation to their gut. All those are great reasons to have dysmotility of the gut. Medications, such as narcotics, opioids are very common, uh, are a very common cause of slowing down the gut. And it really happens in a dose-response manner.
even patients who say, oh, even you know, taking a big dose of opioid doesn't really make me feel different, the effects on the gut, your body does not get used to them. That's why the higher, do the, higher the dose that is needed to control pain, it's still going to affect the gut that much more. And anticholinergics, things like Bentol and other medications can also contribute to slowing down the gut. <coughs> Finally, as I said, PPIs is a bit of a question mark, and, his, and removal of the stomach can contribute to it, and then chronic pancreatitis as well. Now, how is SIBO diagnosed? Um, there are a few ways. One of them is breath testing, which I believe you, uh, you may have heard of. Why do we like to do it? One, it's really easy to do. You consume, when someone consumes lactulose or glucose, and then you exhale into a machine, and that machine measures the amount of gas that is being produced by the bacteria, which is excreted. You know, your lungs can take care of, of removing it from your body. So the machine can read how much gas is being produced by your gut. And what's nice about breath testing is that it can guide the choice of antibiotics. And as we discussed just now, if you have SIBO, we treat, it, we treat that in one way. If you have EMO, we treat it with another set of antibiotics. So it can really help us decide how to treat the patient. Any test, we need the caveat of you can have false negatives and false positives. So nothing is 100%. So it's really hard to grab onto a test and you know, be convinced of the results 100% without any guidance because there are certain cases that are exceptions to the rule. For example, if someone has very fast gut transit, the lactulose that they consume can reach the large colon very fast, and it's normal for it to be fermented in the large colon. So that can give us a false positive. And this is just an illustration of you, instead of food, we give you a specific meal of glucose or lactulose, they get to the small bowel, bacteria in the small bowel digest it, release the gas. The gas will cause symptoms maybe, and also will go th through the bloodstream to be released in the lungs. And the lungs take care of, sort of they poop the gas out. What's another way to diagnose it? Another way is, the upper, is an upper endoscopy with small bowel aspiration. We don't love to do this because it's more invasive, right? We would have to do the upper endoscopy. If you're getting an upper endoscopy for a different reason, it may be less of an invasive study in and of its own, but the, just to do an upper endoscopy for this is a bit invasive. It does have the added value of if you have SIBO that's not responding to certain antibiotics, it can really give us a good, through culture, it can give us exactly what the bacteria is sensitive to. So it can help us you know, figure out, oh, you didn't respond to this antibiotic because your flora is resistant to this antibiotic. We can try this other antibiotic and it can help us know that. Um, it can also have the added value of diagnosing CIFO, which is fungal overgrowth, because our breath test can't catch CIFO. But on the other hand, it has its negatives, right? Everything has pros and cons. The con one of the cons is that it can't identify emo. So we really need the breath test for that diagnosis. And it can be false positive from contamination, and this is very center dependent and technique dependent, but if we're taking the sample and we accidentally touch the mouth, that can be a false positive, for example. And then finally, we don't necessarily do it at our institution, but you may see it in different institutions, especially institutions that don't have access to breath testing easily. They may decide to treat SIBO empirically, saying, hey, I think you have SIBO. Let's treat it and see if you get better, um, which is, it's debatable. Some physicians believe in it, but we don't necessarily think it's the best thing to be done. This is just so the reference that we use, which is which was actually the first author was uh, the first speaker of today, Dr. Azai, and Dr. Pimentel is there as well. And this is what we use to I, to interpret the bet tests. Now, what are the pillars of SIBO management? And there are three big pillars in the management of SIBO. One is that we would like to address the modifiable underlying causes. So fix anything that we can within our limitations. Two is treating. So you have this overgrowth. You're in a state of overgrowth. We want to knock down the number of bacteria and try to get things more balanced. And then three, we want to prevent it from, from happening again. Because one thing about SIBO is that it, ha it 
has a very high recurrence rate. So more about one, in terms of addressing the modifiable underlying causes, if it's opioid related, ideally we, stop, we can decrease the dose of the opioids, for example, or we can put medications that antagonize opioids specifically at the level of the gut. And if it's related to a certain disease, for example, like IBD, would ideally we'd get better control. Or if it's diabetes that's causing dysmotility of the gut, we try to at least prevent it from getting worse and maybe make it get better. So ideally, we would have perfect control of the underlying disease, Crohn's, celiac disease, diabetes, anything of the sort that we can control, we try to. And we try to hope to do that before we try to hope to eradicate the SIBO. Two, treatment. Um, the first line of treatment is antibiotics. Um, antibiotic choices, we have a lot of them. The most common one that you must have heard of is rifaximin, and I think we mentioned it uh, earlier during the talk. That is one common antibiotic that we use. There are a lot of other antibiotics, but the other antibiotics often have systemic absorption, and we really want to minimize any adverse events that you might get from any medications we give you. That's why we try to go for the smallest gun possible to try to help bridge you to, to help bridge the patients to better control of the SIBO rather than going for the most broad antibiotics, but sometimes we have to resort to those. And then, so the antibiotics can improve symptoms and normalize breath tests. And for hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen, as I said, it's rifaximin, we could add bismuth to the hydrogen sulfide, as Dr. Pimentel mentioned, or for the treatment of methane, SIBO, or emo, I'll let Kokai speak to that um, in more details. Alternatives, these are just the names of antibiotics that we could use, like ciprofloxacin, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, doxycycline, metronidazole, and tetracycline. But again, we don't love to pursue this unless we are convinced that the patient has SIBO and we think that they may have some resistance to the first line treatment. Another way to induce remission is the elemental diet. Now, what is the elemental diet? It's not some magic formulation. It doesn't necessarily have ma <laughs> doesn't have specific things added to it, but rather it's a diet that's broken down to its most basic components. And what's great about that is that it doesn't have any allergens or any molecules um, that can trigger disease. And also it doesn't have mo molecules that we can't break down, like fiber. So when you consume the elemental diet, you don't really need to digest it. It's already broken down to its smallest bits and pieces. All your body needs to do is to absorb it. So when it gets to the beginning of your small gut, you directly begin absorbing it. And ideally, it doesn't reach the end of the, the small gut even. How does that help SIBO? As you can imagine, SIBO, it, if the nutrition doesn't reach the end of the gut, you're not feeding those bacteria. You're not giving them fiber that you can't digest that they can only feed on you're sort of depriving them of food. And as you decrease their, their nutrition while maintaining yours, they're going to reduce in numbers. And that's how it can help with SIBO. Now, another question is, is SIBO the only disease elemental diet can help? And absolutely not. It can help a lot of other things. Why? Because it doesn't have those allergens. So say someone is, has celiac disease. It doesn't have gluten in it, so it should help with that. If they have any other... Uh, illness that is triggered by envir environmental food, it should not trigger those diseases. Now, what's the catch? One big catch is that it doesn't taste great in general. At least the formulations that are currently in the market, they don't taste great. That is one. And that's really one of the biggest things that we encounter in clinical practice because we can recommend it. But if it tastes awful, patients are not, not going to stay on it. And the thing is that you would have to drink it exclusively. And you can't, it's not like you add it onto your normal diet. Now, there is a new formulation that does taste better, but it's not yet available in the market, but it should be soon. And as I said earlier, the recurrence rate of SIBO is very high, unfortunately. Now, how long does it take for someone to have a recurrence of SIBO? It's very variable between one person and another. Some people have actually figured out, you know, I get it every this often. They just sort of, get used to it. But I, ideally, that's not the case. Ideally, we try to 
fix, uh, treat the SIBO and delay the recurrence as much as we can. How can we delay the recurrence? Um, and yeah, roughly half of SIBO patients experience a relapse within a year. I think that's an important number to keep in mind. Diet is a big factor in terms of how we can maintain remission from SIBO and how we can minimize recurrence. Carbs are the primary substrates for bacteria in RKO. But data is lacking in terms of, we don't have rigorous studies in terms of, oh, does this food worse than SIBO? Does this food worse than SIBO? But we have a good idea by now. We know that uh, low carbs diets have been proposed, but more specifically, low fermentation, low FODMAP diet, have, we have seen success in terms of preventing SIBO recurrence. And the low fermentation diet is very similar to the low FODMAP diet. It is less restrictive. And that is the one we usually favor in our center. The thing about these diets, though, is that they, we have to be cautious of the long-term side effects of overly restrictive diets. Because if you exclude a lot of food groups, and the patients have their own restrictions that they don't like this food or that food, so when we end up excluding large proportion of what is sort of healthy diet, but that triggers symptoms in SIBO patients, we have to be very careful about not causing any nutritional deficiencies in patients and making sure that they get a, an overall balanced diet. Another way to help is meal spacing. And as we mentioned before, and this, base, this is based on promoting those migrating motor complexes and making sure your gut motility, we're trying to help it as much as we can. So prolonged fasting, we know that, can, that it can promote gut motility through promoting the migrating motor complexes. And one way to help promote this is to try to space out meals and not really snack in between meals. And ideally, it would be for four and a half hours or more to help trigger them. Another way to try to get more MMCs is to try to fast an applicable way, a pragmatic way, is to try to have dinner relatively early on and not snack before sleeping. That way, while you're sleeping, that does count sort of as fasting time. And that way, you can distance the time between meals and promote these motion waves as much as possible. And then we can give medications that are prokinetics, but the data in terms of prospective trial for these medications are limited. So we don't have rigorous clinical studies that support these, um, but we have seen some success with them. Prokinetics, there are a few that are available to us. They include low-dose erythromycin and procalopride. But the patients that benefit from these prokinetics are highly selected patients. So it's not that anybody who's ever had SIBO should be on a prokinetic. And then in terms of future directions, we, there is some data to suggest that maybe statins can help re, uh, reduce the microbial overgrowth, specifically with emo. And maybe supplements like algae extract are being studied, to, again, to see if they can help control these microbial populations. But the data is still not there. So we can't really recommend it, especially not broadly. And a lot of these will end up being very patient-specific. And as we've discussed earlier today, the microbiome connection is a great way to learn more about things that we glance over today, specifically the diet and the, the reasoning behind the fasting periods. This is a great resource for you to learn more about these. So what are the take home messages? SIBO and EMO represent an overgrowth of normal gut flora in an abnormal way. And that makes it um, abnormal and that's what causes the symptoms. Symptoms are many and include diarrhea, constipation, and distension. Diagnosis can be made by using breath testing or small bowel aspiration. Treatment is usually with antibiotics and differs between SIBO and EMO and SIFO. And the elemental diet is an option for certain situations. It's not necessarily for, ever, for everybody. And recurrence is common. It should be expected, but we should try to work as much as we can to minimize the recurrence. And prevention can be attempted by dietary modifications and certain medications. And that's it for my talk. Um, next, I'll introduce Dr. Yin Chan, who will be speaking on H. pylori. All right, thank you um, for inviting me to give this talk. Um, I'm going to talk about H. pylori, which is switching gear a little bit about something's happening in the stomach. 
So all this is kind of more developed than what you previously heard about bacteria in the small bowel or in the colon. So feel free to put your pen down. You don't need to take any pictures. Everything I talk about today will be on the internet, on Wikipedia, PubMed. So, but it's a very interesting story, and I really want to spend a few minutes to go over it because we're in Hollywood, and this is honestly a story that is waiting for a screenplay, and I'll tell you why. All right. So, you know, people have been getting stomach pains, you know, feeling full after eatings, maybe having bleeding afterwards for like thousands and thousands of years, okay? And from 50,000 BC to 1984, people thought it was like IBS. Uh, you literally had people saying, Oh, you have stomach pain because you're stressed, you're smoking, you're high risk, high stress job. You know, it's not an organic condition. And so the marketplace, just like IBS, was filled with these, you know, snake oil kind of like treatments. And so this is one ad for like a treatment for stomach ulcers. And there were spas all throughout North America and Europe where they would offer to relax you and help you treat your stomach ulcers and your stomach pain. And this was all legitimate. It was not a science that people were interested in. They thought, this is all in your head. Kind of like what Dr. Pimentel described about IBS. But of course, now we know this is not true. And how we got there was very recent, in the 1980s when this happened. And this was all due to two men uh, pictured here. Uh, on the left is uh, Barry Marshall, and on the right is Robin Warrens, and they're both Australian. They're very different people from my understanding. So the person on the right is a pathologist. He's older, he's established. He was a staff uh, pathologist in a hospital in Australia. While the man on the left, Barry Marshall, was, um, he was basically just out of medical school. He was like a new resident who was assigned to do a research project uh, as part of his training. And so around that time, you know, um, gastroenterologists began doing endoscopy. They were taking samples of stomach tissues in patients with stomach pain and bleeding and to look under the microscope. And around that time, they were also developing techniques to kind of look at the different bacteria um, that were visible in these samples. And uh, Robin Warren began noticing that a lot of patients with stomach ulcers had these uh, curvy, spirochy kind of bacteria uh, in them. And majority of patients with ulcer had these uh, bacteria. He wasn't the first one to notice this, to be honest. It, looking back, people have noticed this as well. But he was the first one to thought, I think this is why patients have ulcers. Of course, no one believed them, because remember when I told you, people thought this was a stress thing, and no one thought it was an organic cause related to their symptom. So. Uh, Barry Marshall was advised to talk to uh, uh, Dr. Warren and start a project in this area. And so two of them looked, uh, basically did a database of patients with ulcers and found that the majority of them had this bacteria, H. pylori, in their stomach samples. They even, proved, they even showed that if you can eradicate these bacteria, it seemed to improve their symptoms. But then again, no one believed them. So what did it take to finally get the medical um, science to believe that this was the cause of the bacteria, of the ulcers? Well, that's when Barry Marshall had his kind of Nobel Prize winning idea, or the gambit. And this is forever immortalized in this comic seat trip. Apparently, it's in the Nobel Prize Museum. So essentially, um, he did a scope on a patient with ulcers, saw the bacteria, grew the bacteria, and then drank it himself. And sure enough, 10 days later, he had developed stomach upsets, and he had a scope, and they found the same bacteria, same ulcers. And this is a picture of the microbiologist who grew it, apparently. And this was his real-time reaction. The funny thing is that he said in an interview later on that he told his wife what he did. And his wife was just livid. And she said, don't give it to me and my kids. <laughs> But he persisted, and 10 days later, you know, they had a scope and proved that you know, this, previously he was healthy. He took this bacteria and then had developed ulcers, kind of like a, a causality um, effect. And this eventually won both of them the Nobel Prize in 2005. Um, no movies yet, I've checked. Uh, I actually went to a lecture given by Barry Marshall in Toronto uh, when I was a PhD student. Uh, I didn't get to meet him personally, but my colleague said he did wear his uh, Nobel Prize 
uh, medal <laughs> around his neck, and they, he did show it off to them in the elevator at SickKids uh, after the talk. Uh, but apparently, he's a very interesting guy. So now that we kind of talked about the fun part, let's kind of get to the, some of the facts we now know about H. pylori. And we do know a lot about H. pylori. Uh, we know it's been affecting humans for at least 50,000 years. And the most astounding fact you look on Wikipedia is that it's probably present about 50% of the population in the world. It's more common definitely in certain countries and in certain places, depending on the socioeconomic status of the environment. And we know that in the last you know, 10 years, the rates have gone down slightly, probably about 40%, because we've been treating it a lot more. Um, and hygiene and, standards, cleaning and uh, health standard has gone up. But there's still really common uh, infection in human. So how, is it, how do you get it? Well, this is actually the part that we don't really understand completely. We do know that you, know, you can, and I emphasize can, get it from kissing, sharing utensils, drinking contaminated water, having poor hygiene, living in crowded conditions, and oftentimes uh, from your own family, from kind of vertical transmissions or from parents to uh, children. Yet, this is not like infectious gastroenteritis. It's not like you just go someplace, you drink some contaminated water, you get it. It's actually really hard to get as an adult. And we've actually, not we, but like the medical community have studied this extensively. And we now know that probably over 90% of H. pylori infection occurs in early childhood. So it's not like you, you know, going to a country and picking it up and coming back. If you're positive of H. pylori in, on any testing, most likely you got it as a kid or in early childhood, and it has persisted asymptomatically, at least, uh, until you develop symptoms or you incidentally uh, tested positive on, on, uh, on a, uh, for one reason or another. Um, Obviously, there's always exceptions to a rule, but that's sort of the, the current understanding of how uh, you have H. pylori. So why do we care? Well, as I mentioned before, the, you, most, the people who have H. pylori generally already had H. pylori the entire life. And if you look at sort of as a population, 80% of these people generally have no symptom. If you look close enough and take samples in the stomach, they probably have a bit of inflammation, inflammation, but it's probably not giving them any trouble. The, the, the reason why we're interested in H. pylori is that about 1% of people develop severe, severe uh, issues with, related to H. pylori. And those things we worry about are gastric cancer and uh, gastric lymphoma, which are uh, directly caused by H. pylori. But clearly, not everybody with H. pylori can develop these serious complications, and that's the part we don't understand completely why. A lot of it has to do with you know, where H. pylori is infecting, what kind of H. pylori it is, and sort of what other environmental and host factors are at play, which is basically shorthand for saying we don't understand. It's still under investigation. But in, sort of in, for our clinic and for sort of the Western society, you know, the, 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 the symptom we're trying to, that we're looking for to treat um, or looking to test H. pylori for is dyspepsia. So these like non-cancerous symptoms of discomfort, uh, fullness, uh, what we call term dyspepsia, is commonly associated with H. pylori as well. And in the hospital, um, having ulcers in the stomach or a small bowel is often commonly associated with H. pylori. So these are the sort of the symptoms that, you know, that is associated with H. pylori infections. And kind of go from the left, the most common, to more alarming to the right. Obviously, my slides did not come out perfectly. My apologies. Um, the middle ones of burning pain, the upper abdomen, pain worse uh, on an empty stomach, nausea, loss of appetite. Those are what we call the spepsia type symptoms. And um, that's probably the most common uh, symptoms in patients who develop issues with H. pylori. Well, on the far right, Symptoms such as unintentional weight loss, severe abdominal pain, uh, black, tarry stool, uh, throwing up black or red blood, those are consistent with uh, cancer or ulcers. So th those are the things that you know, will prompt like an urgent uh, trip to the hospital emergency room. But as I mentioned previously on the previous slide, it's less, very less common. And so you know, when we look under the, the endoscopy, so when we take you to do a camera test in the stomach, as I mentioned before, 80% people, if you look by eye, it's probably look, the stomach's gonna look normal. 
if you look by microscope, generally everybody has a little bit of inflammation, while you know, much smaller percentage, about 20, less than 20% would have either ulcers in the stomach or duodenum, or you know, the rare, one, rare cases would have uh, cancer, either gastric cancer or malt lymphoma um, present when you take a look. So just to emphasize, you know, the most commonly it would be patient with H. pylori would have normal uh, endoscopy. So uh, H. pylori is, is probably one of the first thing we do when someone presents with these dyspepsia type symptoms, like I mentioned before, fullness, pain, bloating. And the reason we do this is because there's, this, there's pretty good data that if you have these symptoms and H. pylori, treatment of the H. pylori will improve the symptoms. Uh, and this is through multiple clinical trials or st studies have done in the past and through meta-analysis. It's not perfect. It's not like every single person with these symptoms and H. pylori will get better completely with, uh, with treatment. But based on current understanding, the large percentage will. And therefore, we do look for it when these symptoms are present and we can't find any other issues. And uh, we do treat H. pylori whenever we detect it. So because H. pylori is so common, but not common enough that we have to test everyone, there are guidelines who we should test uh, uh, in, in America and uh, essentially any other regions of the world. So in the United States, generally if you have symptoms of dyspepsia, ulcers in the stomach or small bowel, uh, gastric, early gastric cancer, or some rare conditions like idiopathic thrombocytopenia or angiogenesis anemia, the current guidelines recommend you would do empiric testing for this bacteria. So if you don't have any symptoms, so you feel well, who should get testing? Well, as I mentioned before, there's a strong vertigo transmission from, par from parents to kids. So if your family member have a proven H. pylori infection, you should get tested. Also, if you have a family history of gastric cancer or ulcers, then you should get tested. Uh, and then also, there's a, there's a the line saying that if you are from an area of um, high prevalence, so you're coming from a country or a region with high uh, prevalence of H. pylori, and you move to the United States, you should be tested as well, even though you're feeling well. And then lastly, if you're somebody who's going to go on um, long-term NSAID use, like steroid, sorry, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory uh, drug use, then you should be tested because H. pylori will increase your risk of developing ulcers uh, when you're taking uh, NSAIDs long-term. Okay. So how do you test for H. pylori? Well, it's really divided into invasive testing and non-invasive testing. Invasive testing just means like something that is going to be uncomfortable versus something that's more comfortable. And invasive testing generally is uh, as part of an uh, endoscopy or like a camera test, scope test of your stomach. And that's generally either, as uh, Barry Marshall and Robert Warren did in the past, taking samples and then staining for the bacteria and looking under the microscope, or other biochemical tests from the pathology sample. Uh, you can also grow it like they did in the past too, but that's much more rare. But since this is in, you know, it's expensive, it is, um, you know, has potential risk of complication, we generally, unless there's a really good reason for uh, doing it, we're gonna use non-invasive testing, so testing that we can do from Quest Lab or any lab um, in the community. And the two main uh, non-invasive testing would be basically testing some, a stool sample or doing a breath test. Uh, they're both very, very good, like they're probably between 95 and 100% in terms of accuracy, uh, but generally, you know, if the, the, the insurance company or the economic analysis will show that the stool engine testing is generally cheaper than the breath test, and so that's the, probably the, the more common uh, test that's being done uh, currently at this time. Okay. So how do you treat H. pylori? Well, it's actually very, very complicated. So I have not really included every single drug because it would fill up the entire um, slide plus a few more slides. But I'm gonna just talk about the general kind of like points about treatment for H. pylori. The first is that it's probably gonna be for at least 14, probably 14 days. And it's gonna involve at least multiple pills, at least two, probably four pills. Per, uh, and because you're gonna to have to have, take something that's kind of an like NSAID, like either a proton pump inhibitor or bismuth or something called potassium competitive acid blockers. These things kind of decrease the, um, the acid production in the stomach. Uh, 
Bismuth also can uh, have some uh, ability to kill off H. pylori as well. And you need to combine that with antibiotics. And this could either be one antibiotic or even up to three different antibiotics. And that's because uh, there is resistance in H. pylori. And it, there is generally not one antibiotic can kill all the um, H. pylori out there in North America. And the reason why I'm not very specific about this is because a lot of it depends on where you're living, your uh, penicillin allergy status, and sort of your other comorbidities. But because you know all these, there's so many antibiotics or an acid being taken, it take, treatment for H. pylori is commonly associated with side effects. Uh, at least 30% of the some sort of GI upsets or diarrhea. And generally, when this happens, we recommend you speaking to your gastroenterologist or your prescriber to see what needs to be done. Either do you need to change regimen or do you just push through and, con and continue? But side effects are commonly um, seen when you're being treated for H. pylori. One of the, one of the key points also is that H. pylori is not easily treated in a lot of cases, and so they really recommend checking afterwards, so a, a month after finishing antibiotics, to check whether the H. pylori is completely um, eradicated, and that's generally through non-invasive testing, such as the breath test we talked about before, or the stool testing. Okay. The, good, the good news is that it's actually really, really hard to catch H. pylori again. So as I mentioned before, you probably caught it as a kid, finally you present as an adult with some sort of symptom, they tested it, you got treated. The chance of you picking up H. pylori again is probably each year is like one, less than 1%. And this is a little bit more if you live in uh, places where there's high prevalence or where there's like less hygiene, but in North America, generally, it's very rare to catch it again. Um, and so you know, usually one treatment is, is enough for most, for most people. Uh, more commonly, if you develop H. pylori again within the first year or two years after being treated, that's actually not picking up a new uh, strain of H. pylori. It's just that H. pylori got partially treated. It's hiding, and it, your test was negative, but it just came back after a certain amount of time. Uh, so this is one of the key factors that it's really, really hard to catch H. pylori again. And that kind of goes back to the theme I talked about earlier, that you know, H. pylori seems to be more easily infect younger children as opposed to adults. This is actually a common you know, thing in the, we get in clinics that people ask, like, do we need to keep checking H. pylori? Generally, we don't unless there's a really good reason for it. Okay. okay so I'm just going to summarize my, uh, my talk. Um, really, very f a few key points. So H. pylori is a common stomach bacteria, up to 40 to 50% of the world's population, less than 40% in North America, but that's already a really common bacteria. It's found almost exclusively in the stomach. And it's typically acquired in childhood and persists throughout adulthood. And generally, it's, you know, it's not asymptomatic and you don't really develop any issues with it. But in some um, percentage of patients, you get uh, abdominal symptoms or in worst case scenario, ulcers or cancers uh, due to the H. pylori infection. The good news is that you know, we, it is kind of a more developed story, so we have really good treat, uh, testing and treatment for H. pylori. Although right now, there's no one single pill you can take. Generally, there's multiple bit, a pill, uh, number of pills uh, that you have to take for 14 days. And because of the number of pills, you're going to more, more than likely will develop some sort of GI upsets or other side effects. But uh, generally, most patients are able to complete the course and have it eradicated uh, without too much issue. And the good news is that you likely won't be picking up again in the future. All right, and that's all for me today. Uh, so I'm going to introduce Amrit. Um, he's one of our new staff at C Design. He's going to be talking about C. diff, another uh, uh, disease that's caused by a bacteria. To continue the theme. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amrit Kamboj, and I'm a member of the Cedar Sinai Motility team. Today I will be talking about Clostridioides difficile infection, diagnosis and treatment. And thank you to the International Foundation for Gastrointestinal Disorders for having me here today. And uh, equally important, thanks for all of you being here. I would like to disclose that I used several resources from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, or the CDC, for today's talk to reinforce some of the high yield take home points. <clears throat> 
The objectives for today's talk will be to provide a comprehensive review of Clostridioides difficile infection, including its epidemiology, clinical features, diagnosis, and treatment. So Clostridioides difficile, that's a handful, and uh, the short name for this is C. diff, and that's what we will refer to for today's talk. This is what C. diff looks like. It's a spore and toxin producing gram positive anaerobic bacterium. And so that's kind of a handful, but it has the ability to generate spores that allow it to survive outside of the body for extended periods of time. And it produces two toxins, toxin A and B, that allow it to cause infection and symptoms. This commonly arises when the normal gut flora is disrupted, as in the case of antibiotics, which may be used for a urinary tract infection, pneumonia, skin infection. While the antibiotics are useful in treating that particular infection, they can also disrupt the gut microbiome, and harmful bacteria such as C. diff can take over the colon and cause infection. Several studies have been done on C. diff, and the most common other risk factors besides antibiotics for C. diff infection include advanced or older age, recent hospitalization, severe illness, conditions that weaken the immune system, and also inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. I'll now take some time to outline why everyone in this room should care about C. diff. And for one, it's everywhere. It affects everyone, and it can, has the potential to affect everyone across the country or the world uh, in every state and uh, of all uh, people of all ages. And it's estimated to cause almost half a million infections in the U.S. each year. Reason number two is that C. diff is commonly not a one and done. In fact, one in six patients who get C. diff infection will get it again in the subsequent two to eight weeks. If those are not enough reasons, here are some more. C. diff infection can be lethal. In fact, it accounts for 29,300 deaths annually. And specifically in our older population, those over age 65 years, one in 11 will die within one month of C. diff infection. Another reason to care about C. diff is that we discussed antibiotic use sometimes disrupts the gut microflora, uh, and C. diff can arise as a result. And antibiotic use in today's community is common. And those with recent antibiotic use are more likely to have C. diff, maybe seven to 10 times more likely. Now, not all C. diff infection causes trouble, and there is a concept what we call colonization. This is when C. diff may be present within an individual, but it doesn't cause any symptoms. It's also known as the C. diff carrier state. Take, for example, the man in this image. If you do a stool sample, for example, you might see some C. diff organisms, and, but he otherwise feels fine and has no signs or symptoms, and this is what we call colonization with C. diff. In a carrier state, C. diff is kept in check by other bacteria and as a result doesn't uh, cause any trouble. C. diff colonization is not uncommon and does not require treatment. C. diff colonization may occur after a recent C. diff infection that was appropriately treated with a course of antibiotics, but there may be some leftover a small number of C. diff organisms. It may occur after a recent hospitalization. It may also occur in those with frequent antibiotic use and the disruption of the gut microbiome. And as a result, hand hygiene is very important for everyone to uh, prevent acquiring C. diff infection and limiting its spread to other people. Now, the clinical presentation for C. diff infection can be quite variable. As we discussed, some individuals may not have any symptoms at all, such as those who are colonized with C. diff, but at the other extreme, People can be pretty sick from C. diff infection, and death can even result. The most common symptom with C. diff infection is watery diarrhea, and that can be mild, moderate, or severe to the point of causing dehydration. Typically, the diarrhea consists of watery stools that are not bloody. Other individuals may also experience abdominal pain, nausea, or vomiting. And in a subset of patients, fever may also be present. What are some complications of C. diff infection? 
In addition to causing diarrhea when there's severe infection present, there may also be inflammation or irritation of the colon that can result, and that is what we term colitis or inflammation of the colon. When this inflammation of the colon is even more severe, it can spread through the different layers of the colon, and it can actually affect the motility or the movement ability of the colon, and the colon can get paralyzed and be distended with air. And in some cases, when patients are critically ill, it may also cause rupture or what we call a perforation of the colon. In more severe cases, Patients may also present with what we call sepsis, which is a chain reaction triggered in the body from an infection where there can be high fevers, heart rate can be really high, blood pressure can be really low, the breathing rate can be really high, and sometimes patients with this uh, presentation may require a level of care in the ICU. You might be wondering who to test for C. diff infection, and this is an individualized de de decision that is made between a discussion between the patient and their healthcare provider, but a general rule of thumb is that it may be reasonable to test for C. diff infection in those who have three or more stools per day, assuming that they're not taking a laxative or some other contributing factor. How do we diagnose C. diff? Stool tests are the mainstay for diagnosis of C. diff infection, and there's different varieties of stool tests. Some labs may use a PCR or a polymerase chain reaction, which looks at genes that are associated with toxic forms of C. diff. Other labs may use the antigen, which detects whether C. diff is present with or without toxin production. They may do a secondary test to check for those active toxins A and B. And a third test that's sometimes employed is a stool culture, but this can be cumbersome as it requires growth for several days in the lab. In addition to doing a stool test when there's suspicion for C. diff, it's also important to check some blood work. And the two main things to check for are the complete blood count, specifically looking at the white blood cell count, which can help determine the severity of infection, and also the creatinine blood test, which is a measure of the kidney function. Endoscopy is also sometimes performed in evaluation of C. diff infection, and I put an asterisk next to it because this is not required for diagnosis and should generally not be performed in everyone with C. diff infection. However, endoscopy may play a role in those with a severe presentation or where the diagnosis of C. diff is unclear or the stool test re reveals an indeterminate result. To show you what we might find on endoscopy, this is an example of how the colon may appear normal. It kind of has a, a salmon colored, a pink colored to it with uh, vasculature that you can see the blood vessels very clearly. However, when there's inflammation or colitis that is occurring from C. diff infection, there can be redness throughout with some ulcers that can even be present. And the most severe form of C. diff infection that we sometimes see on endoscopy is something known as pseudomembranous colitis where Again, kind of the colon is very inflamed and irritated, and there can be white or yellow plaques that line the colon. Cross-sectional imaging, such as with a CT scan of the abdomen or pelvis, again, this has an asterisk because this is not required in everyone who has C. diff infection, but may be uh, performed to evaluate for some of those complications that we discussed that can be seen with C. diff infection. Here are some images that highlight colon thickening or inflammation, and the arrows point to areas where the bowel wall is really thickened or swollen. Again, this, these images highlight the toxic megacolon where the colon becomes paralyzed, full of air, and it can even rupture uh, if left untreated for a long period of time. C. diff infection can be either mild to moderate, it can be severe, or it can be fulminant, which is a step above severe. Severe infection is usually defined by those abnormal blood tests. If the white blood cell count is elevated more than 15,000 and the creatinine or the kidney function number is elevated greater than 1.5, those are signs that a patient may be experiencing a severe C. diff. If endoscopy is performed, inflammation or the pseudomembranous colitis may be seen, and CT scan may show bowel wall thickening. Fulminant C. diff is a step above uh, severe C. diff, and this usually requires 
presence of these things seen with severe C. diff, like the elevated white count and the creatinine numbers, but also presence of multi-organ failure where there can be hypotension or shock, low blood pressure, there can be ileus or slowing of the colon, or there can be that megacolon where the colon becomes very distended and full of air. Not all, uh, not all cases of chronic watery diarrhea are due to C. diff. And there are a list of conditions that can cause watery diarrhea, such as other infections, post-infectious irritable, irritable bowel syndrome or condition, celiac disease, microscopic colitis, inflammatory bowel disease are just a handful of other diagnoses that we think about in someone presenting with watery stools. I'll also highlight the concept of recurrent C. diff, which is defined as Total resolution of symptoms, such as watery diarrhea, while on appropriate treatment for C. diff, but then once the treatment is stopped, there's a recurrence of symptoms just two to eight weeks after completion of treatment. And as we had reviewed before, one in six individuals will get recurrent C. diff, so it's not a one and done for everyone. Risk factors for those who may get recurrent C. diff are older individuals, those with severe medical comorbidities, and those that need ongoing antibiotics while receiving C. diff treatment. And if you have a recurrence one time, it does increase your risk of getting recurrences again in the future. Now we'll shift to management and treatment of C. diff infection. And some principles regarding the management of C. diff infection, in the hospital and even at home, everyone should follow what we call contact precautions. Everyone should clean their hands, before entering and leaving the patient room or contacting with the patient. And usually we use hand soap and water rather than alcohol-based sanitizers because those by themselves are not sufficient to eradicate the spores that can be seen with C. diff. Providers may also wear gloves, gowns, use dedicated equipment. We should also scrutinize carefully whether the patient needs antibiotics because we know that using those can disrupt the gut microbiome. So if there's no need for ongoing antibiotic use, antibiotics should be discontinued. And those with severe watery diarrhea or dehydration may require IV fluids. Treatment for a first episode of C. diff, whether it be non-severe or severe, Typically, there's two medication options, and some of the common uh, treatment regimens I'll highlight in my slides. So one option may be to use an antibiotic called fidaxomycin taken for 10 days, or alternatively, oral vancomycin may also be used taken for 10 days. Several years ago, kind of our go-to medication for treatment of C. diff infection was one called metronidazole or flagyl, but Studies over the last few years show that metronidazole may not work as effectively as fidaxomycin or vancomycin. So really, this is kind of only used now if the above treatments are not available. In cases with the fulminant disease of C. diff, where, the, where it's a step above severe, this is where IV fluids may really be needed. And because this can be even a life-threatening condition, there we use a combination of two medications, IV metronidazole and oral vancomycin at a high dose uh, taken together. And if the patient has ileus or slowing of the gut, rectal administration of vancomycin enemas may also be considered. What about if you have a recurrence or reoccurrence of symptoms two to eight weeks after you had resolution of your symptoms with initial treatment? The key here is to use an alternative treatment than what was used before. So if the initial treatment consisted of the fidaxomycin or vancomycin or metronidazole, one step may be to consider what we call a prolonged vancomycin taper. Rather than a 10-day course of treatment, it might last for several weeks. How about in cases where vancomycin or metronidazole was used before? This is where fidaxomycin, something else, uh, might, might, might play a role. Here are some common ways to use fidaxomycin twice a day for 10 days or twice a day for five days and then once every other day for 20 days. That's the extent protocol. And then vancomycin, especially if there was initial response with a 10-day course, you might use a prolonged taper that lasts several weeks. Bezlotuximab is an IV monoclonal antibody infusion that has been shown to have some benefit in decreasing recurrence of C. diff and this may be used in some cases where patients are high risk for recurrent infections. 
If you have a second recurrence, again, you can use an antibiotic treatment that you haven't used before, such as fidaxomycin or vancomycin. But once you kind of get the second recurrence, this is where fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT, may play a role. And just to give you a little bit of background on this fecal microbiota transplantation, or FMT, this involves collecting stool from a healthy donor and instilling this in a patient with C. diff with the goal of restoring their micro gut microbiome. In this process, stool is collected and processed from a healthy donor and instilled into a patient with C. diff infection. Donors are carefully screened for medical conditions and infections. For C. diff treatment, FMT is greater than 90% effective, and it's most commonly currently administered via colonoscopy, but other methods have been studied and are being uh, developed, such as use of oral capsules. Generally, it is well tolerated. Patient may present for a colonoscopy. They get the colonoscopy with the FMT. They go home the same day. There might be some self-limited abdominal discomfort that resolves within a few hours or days. And there is, a, uh, despite the careful screening of the donors, there can be a rare risk of transmission of infection, although this is very rare. What can we do to prevent C. diff infection? And the key here is hand hygiene. We think this, uh, the spread of C. diff happens by coming into contact with someone who might have C. diff infection or maybe colonized with C. diff, and then they forget to wash their hands, and they may eat something, and then they're kind of colonized with C. diff and may get the C. diff infection. So hand hygiene is really key here. I'll end my talk by sharing some of the frequently asked questions that I get in clinic regarding C. diff infection from my patients. After I have C. diff infection, when can I go back to work? And the key here is only once symptoms have stopped because we want to decrease risk of spread to other individuals. Question two, should I get retested after treatment? I heard Dr. Yin Chan's talk. He shared that for Helicobacter pylori treatment, everyone should be checked with a non-invasive test uh, to make sure H. pylori is gone. Should I be doing the same thing for C. diff? Should I get retested after treatment? And the answer here is no, because you can have a few organisms left over, and that it's kind of that carrier state, and that, that means that that doesn't require any treatment if the patient's not having any persistent symptoms. Retesting should only be considered if symptoms persist or worsen despite treatment. What can I do to avoid getting C. diff again? And again, we, one of the take home messages today is C. diff is not one and done. One in six will get recurrent C. diff. And so avoid antibiotics unless truly indicated. If antibiotics are necessary to uh, get over a, a pneumonia or a urinary tract infection, then using the lowest uh, dose or the lowest number of days of antibiotic use would be important. And inform your doctors that you've had C. diff infection because that may affect their decision in how they treat you for your active medical problems. Hand hygiene, as we highlighted, is very important. And timely testing. If you start having the kind of the watery diarrhea abruptly, it's a sudden change, you had recent antibiotic use, getting tested and letting your healthcare provider know about that is very important to avoid those complications that we discussed with C. diff infection. At this time, there is an unclear role for use of probiotics for prevention of C. diff. There's not a lot of good evidence on that, and there's different probiotic regimens that are out there on the market, so our guidelines recommend that there's an unclear role for the probiotics. Here are my references, and thank you for your time and attention. I will now turn it over to Koka Yip, who's our nurse practitioner in the motility clinic and a key member of our team, and she will share her talk on intestinal methanogen overgrowth, or EMO. Okay, so after listening to everybody's talk, man, I hate to be the last speaker for the day because there are so many good things that they have said, and I find myself having some of the uh, repeated information. So what I'll try to do is I'll try to highlight the similarity and differences between archaea and bacteria. Um, this is kind of like a similar layout to Dr. Nasa earlier. It's important to go over what is emo, symptoms, uh, the role of methanogen and diseases, how do we diagnose emo as well as treatment. 
Uh, the tree might look familiar. I just wanted to point out that, again, gut microbiota can consist of different microorganisms and a population of different microbials that live in the gut, the fairies, depending on each segment of the GI tract that we're talking about. And the impairment of, of the delicate balance of each of these segments uh, matters. Because uh, at the end of the day, SIBO, EMO, whatever it is, it's not an actual infection, just like what they talked about before. It's about excessive growth. And Archaea, in many years ago, just like Dr. Metha, Dr. Pimentel, uh, and the previous speaker have mentioned, it's uh, many years ago who were grouped together under the bacteria domain of life. And it's until recently that it's got its separate domain. So there are now three domains of life. And this is part of the reason why we have a lot of overlaps between SIBO and EMO. Uh, one of the main differences is that there are um, Archaea and bacteria difference uh, in different ways in terms of cellular structure as well as cellular composition of the cell wall. Uh, one of the things that they have uh, similar in biology is some of the like R R RNA that's within their, their cell. The, one of the main methane producing species that uh, have been mentioned before with Dr. Pimentel is the methanobrifid bacter smithia, the M. smithia that we're going to talk about. The, if we want to highlight the differences between archaea and bacteria, the cell membrane of archaea are kind of biosynthesized in a similar way to our, uh, the way that we make cholesterol. And it becomes important as we talk about treatment, because then we'll talk about statin therapy a little bit. Some of you might know that statin therapy <coughs> is a well-known therapy to treat high cholesterol. It reduced on cholesterol in our human body. And the way that it works is that it kind of interferes with the HMG uh, coenzyme A reductase, and therefore it interrupts and affects the growth of a care in that way. And another difference is, is that archaea actually lack a polymer called the patoglycan in the cell wall. So therefore, it, it kind of explains why that archaea as compared to bacteria kind of resistant to many antibiotics, in particular penicillin. And then lastly, the archaea wall doesn't have the lipopolysaccharides. So our human host systems, the immune response, we're able to recognize Archaea, but the way that we respond to archaea is similar to the way that we respond to virus, not bacteria. And then lastly, we want to highlight that there's a very unique metabolic world of archaea is that it produces methane, kind of like what Dr. Pimentel had mentioned before. Here is um, a diagram that we got from a, an article that was published a decade ago. Just like what they had mentioned earlier, the microbiome is very complex, delicate uh, system that we're still trying to learn more and more. Um, what we have gained is that while we're rapidly understanding more and more about it, there's still a lot that we don't know. A decade ago, the uh, authors that had published an article in this World Journal of Gastroenterology had highlighted um, some of the metabolic, uh, well, especially how the hydrogen, carbon dioxide uh, play a role in synthesis of methane by, methano, uh, by methanogens in our gut. And then, uh, and as you can see, there are a lot of questions marked to different diseases such as obesity, inflammatory bowel disease at the time a decade ago. And now we're getting more and more understanding, although the association is still unclear, but there are a lot more that we have known, especially in people who have peritonitis or gum disease. There are detection of methane in those populations, as well as other conditions like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome, diverticulitis disease. What is interesting is that in the population of anorexia nervosa, these are the populations that have this eating disorder that have, find to have presence of archaea. And what is interesting is that archaea, in the way that they, uh, they have that metabolism, they produce a little bit of amount of energy. And it isn't truly clear or whether it's hypothesized that perhaps in patients with eating disorder, maybe the, it's a body's way to adapt and to see if we can harvest as many calories as possible for the host. Now, the archaea in our gut is interesting. While archaea can live on our skin, in our genital urinary system, it has the largest number in our gut, just like what Dr. Mathar pointed out earlier. It could be found in our mouth, in our small bowel, and largely abundance in the colon as well as the appendix. 
And Dr. Wesai earlier pointed out that perhaps the appendix can be surface of replanting reservoir of a KNL body. Dr. Nessa had showed this slide earlier and just wanted to highlight that while small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is the overgrowth of bacteria in a small bowel, EMO, on the other hand, is the overgrowth of a methane producing archaea in the small bowel as well as the colon. So this is what that's. And then um, Dr. Nessa also pointed out some of the selected symptoms of microbial overgrowth. Many of them overlap between SIBO, EMO, even SIFO. One thing to highlight is that the patients with methane gas, methane gas has been known to cause constipation, as well as so it's associated with irritable bowel syndrome with uh, constipation predominant type, while the uh, hydrogen sulfide causes more diarrhea. Now, as they have pointed out earlier, that SIBO, whether it's SIBO or EMO, these are not primary conditions of our body, and usually it is a secondary condition due to something else. And Dr. Nessa earlier pointed out some of these more common condition or risk factors that patients may have that put them at risk for having SIBO or EMO. And uh, these could be like structural abnormality, any kind of underlying dysmotility, like connective tissue diseases, such as lupus, uh, people who are after surgery, such as like having their um, IC valve removed, because then it prevents the protective mechanisms. Uh, it's just kind of like the elevator and the guy who's running up against the elevator he was trying to show you. So this pathway has been shown by Dr. Nasser earlier. Just wanted to highlight that hydrogen as well as methane are exclusively produced by our gut microbiome. Our human hosts are not capable of producing these gases. And these are the backbone of how breath testing works. And similar to how he explained that while SIBO, SIFO can be assessed by breath tests and perhaps even uh, EGD with small bowel aspiration, EMO at this current time is only gonna be able to evaluate about doing a breath test. And how breath testing work is that while he had already explained the underlying mechanism of how gases get transported from the gut to the lungs and then ex exhale in our breath, the, the how we measure the breath test is that we usually use a sugar substrate such as glucose or lactulose. It could be either 10 grams of lactulose or 75 grams of glucose. And what patients do is that at baseline, we have them blow and exhale into a, uh, a bag and then we give them that sugary substrate. After they drink that sugary substrate, every 15 minutes we have them collect a breath sample. They do the same exhalation into the bed. And then we measure the amount of hydrogen as well as methane, and in some tests that's available, hydrogen sulfide as well from those sam breath samples. So here is a sample of how the breath test is being reported. It, depending on the facility and where you get the breath test done, now there's, there are two main different ways. People do it in the clinic or in the facility, or some can do it at home. Um, and some of the reporting, a lot of times, will give you the time sequence, because every 15 minutes you blow into a bag, you'll see a number there. Some of them include a diagram, some of them don't. So while SIBO is positive when there is an increase uh, of hydrogen gas by 20 parts per minute, EMO is different, that it is captured by any elevation of methane level above 10 parts per minute at any time point, because remember, Archaea uh, EMO is uh, affecting both the small bowel as well as colon. So Dr. Anessa had discussed about the three pillars of management of microbial overgrowth. Um, and the most important is that we need to find out if we could to the best that we can what are the underlying costs? What are the risk factors that we can modify? If it's somebody with diabetes, how can we optimize and improve the blood sugar control so that we can reduce risk of relapse in these patients? And then induction of remission, kind of like we pointed out, uh, antimicrobial therapy, like antibiotic, uh, elemental diet, and then for emo, interestingly, there's research that's ongoing for the study of statin, because we remember talk about the cell wall differences and how that works. And um, there's also some small data that talk about wet waste uh, yeast extract, and that is related to the differences in, from what I can remember, H form and L form of the low-fat statin, uh, from the statin therapy, but ongoing research is needed in this area. And then how we maintain remissions by doing uh, dietary changes and lifestyle modification. <clears throat> 
Now, in terms of M. smithia, this is the main methane producing microorganism in the gut that we have talked about earlier. It's resistant to antibiotics like penicillin don't work. There are a lot of other antibiotics don't work. And all of all the antibiotics that's available, kind of like what Dr. Nessa had mentioned, Rifeximin is one of the most studied antibiotic. There are some meta-analysis that came out that have looked over 32 different clinical trials. And uh, among those studies, People who have a positive breath test are able to have a good predictor of who will be a good responder to Ifaximin. And uh, in addition, for people who have methane, like what Dr. Nassar pointed out, combination treatment with Ifaximin plus a second antibiotic such as neomycin gives greater, even higher success with, in this case, 87%. And the reason behind that is that we believe perhaps in addition to suppressing methane producing achaea by removing the abstract, which is the hydrogen that is there to, uh, that is the byproduct from bacteria fermentation. If we remove the hydrogen, perhaps we could also, you know, get rid of methane that way because they don't have the abstract to make the methane. And then, oh, lastly, uh, for patients who are intolerable or are allergic to neomycin, there is an alternative of using metrodinosol. Elemental diet have been mentioned earlier, and its clinical success has been has some good data, especially to 5 and X plus, which is the pre-digested elemental formula. The amount of 5 and X we use is based on the patient's height and weight. And just to highlight, in case elemental diet is something new or new concept to patients, it is a nutritionally exclusive therapy, meaning that patients who choose to go with an elemental diet. They are not allowed to eat or drink anything else other than this formula. So usually treatment comprises of 14 consecutive days, followed by a breath test on day 15. If the breath test continue to be abnormal on day 15, then they might have to go for seven more days for a total of 21 days of treatment. There are pros and cons of elemental diet. Uh, some of it is that because it's pre-digested, we don't have to worry about uh, potential allergy risk or anything like that. The con is mostly reported on the cost, because a lot of insurance drug plans, they don't cover uh, Fibonax or any other kind of nutritional supplement or elemental diet at all. So it's all out of pocket. And the amount or how much it costs, it's different than an individual, because somebody who's small or more petite, they may need less cans of the elemental diet versus somebody who's big and tall, they might need more. So uh, they have mentioned there are high recurrence rates of SIBO, and one of the speculations that you know people may have more relapses are perhaps they are a um, group that have underlying risk factors, because doesn't matter if it's elemental diet or antibiotic treatment, it doesn't really fix the root cause. They are there to reduce down the content of bacterial, microbials, or, or methane producing archaea. So maintenance of remission is important to help prevent these frequent relapses, or at least hopefully we can stretch out the time that people feel good between relapses. So low fermentation eating is a concept that is similar to, to low FODMAP uh, diet, except it is less restricting. The goal is, of course, to prevent these you know, recurrences or reduce down the frequency of recurrences as much as we could. The concept behind it is that we got to remember that not everything we eat can be digested and used by us. So there are things that cannot be used or digested by us. They just keep traveling down the GI tract, and guess what? They feed these microbials. Um, so the focus is then on high protein, low carbohydrate, so that we can limit these amounts of fermentable carbohydrates to feed the microbials as much as we could. And uh, some of the pitfall that we have known from a lot of patients, because there are patients that come in the clinic and be like, oh my gosh, I'm so 100% compliant to the diet, but I'm still having symptoms, I'm still feeling bloated. And we asked about, oh, what do you eat and what kind of things? Especially there was one uh, patient who love to drink uh, green apple green tea. Guess how much of that fake sugar is in those drinks that we cannot digest? Now, 
And when it comes to digestible and non-digestible, hard to digest food there, we highlighted some of the um, uh, uh, things that we could digest, such as table sugar, those highlighted in blues are kind of easier for our body to digest. And the opposite column are those that we should try to stay away from as much as we could. Pretty, pretty much simple carbohydrate, like white potatoes, sweet potato, white bread, French bread, um, anything like that would be better. Try to stay away from dairy as much as possible, because dairy uh, contains lactose, which is um, contains the lactose, which is the most sugar, um, and it's sometimes difficult to digest. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say do's and don'ts on this. Maybe it's more like green light and yellow and red light on the other column. Um, so there are substitute sugar that is sometimes could be challenging. Uh, while table sugar is good, some patients like to use substitute sugar. If you do, try to stay with equal. Um, proteins and nuts are usually good. Um, veggies are, sometimes we get a lot of questions about vegetables. Uh, pretty much cucumber, tomatoes, uh, those are good. And then remember at breakfast earlier this morning, there are milk substitute, almond milk, oat milk, those are good too. In terms of lifestyle modification, earlier we talked about eating mode and fasting mode of the MMC and how we can promote that. Remember the picture that Dr. Nessa showed you with the ocean waves? How can we optimize so that we have more of those big, strong waves, right? So during eating, our body's small bowels are actively working for us. It helps us mix the food, spread the food, and absorb the food that we eat. And while we're not eating during fasting, this is the time that the bowels cleans up. And every 90 minutes to 120 minutes, we get one of these strong repetitive contractions called the MMC that the doctors had talked to you about earlier. There are four main phases of these MMC, and phase three is the one that is the most important. And it's kind of like another analogy is like if I have a housekeeper who comes to clean my bathroom, clean my hallway, clean my living room, clean my kitchen, and then I have a party, and there are so many guests that just the bathroom just gets so dirty all the time. If she works for me for eight hours, by the time she clean everything and go back to clean the bathroom again, it may be an hour and a half to two hours. But if she works for me for 12 hours, she may be able to rotate back to the bathroom a lot more times so that it, the bathroom gets cleaner. So it's kind of like that if we could do something to maximize that time benefits, such as meal spacing, if we could have discrete meal, for example, between lunch and dinner, between dinner and breakfast, if we could have so many hours, as much as we could possible, to allow these MMC to occur. Another thing is bedtime snacking. There are a lot of patients who um, don't know, or they, they just try so much, but they just cannot keep themselves away from that 9.30, 10 o'clock popsicle or ice cream. You know who you are. <laughs> we have talked about that many times. But if you could stay away from nighttime snacking, that could also help. Um, lastly, if you know you try all of the above and you just need the extra help, of course there's the um, low dose erythromycin or a low dose 5-HT4 antagonist such as procolopride that Dr. Nessa mentioned earlier. So lastly, here's the individualized treatment approach of microbial overgrowth. There is what Dr. Ness had talked to you about. In terms of excessive methane or emo, there is the combination broad-spectrum antibiotic with bifaximin and neomycin. And then if there's a clinical response, of course, we have to educate about any kind of recurrence with how do we maintain for remission. And then, uh, and then if there is no clinical response, then we can talk about is it somebody that you know we should consider elemental diet, we treat with a different kind of combination, antibiotics or what they need to do. So lastly, for take home, um, we know that the understanding of the world of methanogens in the gut microbiome and its associated with uh, diseases are a lot of times still not very clear. And, uh, but it's rapidly expanding. At the moment, uh, emo can only be diagnosed through breath testing. So even though there are technologies like EGD, small bowel aspiration, kind of like what uh, Dr. Gabrielle had talked about, it is hard to cultivate as well as do some of those uh, with archaea versus bacteria and fungi. It's much easier to do in the lab. So right now, only breath testing for emo. And then we talked about the three pillars of treatment, identifying the root cause, see what we can treat to modify with factors, uh, induction of emissions, as well as maintenance. Thank you for having me talk to you today.
right. Okay, that was the tour de force of microbiome today. Uh, so, uh, if you have any questions, happy to talk uh, about uh, your questions. In the meanwhile, thank you, everyone. That was that was great. Uh, you know, as you can imagine, putting together a, a microbiome conference um, uh, on a patient education conference it's, it's not easy because there's so many diseases that are involved with microbiome. But we try to put something uh, together that builds up on that information, and then you have the basis of it, and then every disease that uh, gets involved with it. So, uh, but more to come. I have a question about if you have a patient that has IBS and that has not been tested for um, SIBO, would would that person benefit from? And I know you can't answer that question since you don't know the patient, but if the person has IBS symptoms and hasn't been tested, would they benefit from a round of rife vaccine? Uh, so essentially, you mean empirically being treated? Correct. Yeah, so uh, it depends on how available the test is, what's the cost, and, and all. So technically, yes, if rifaximin is approved for IBS diarrhea if you don't have access to uh, breath tests. But let's step back to see how that helps you, right? So breath testing will tell you, as you saw, uh, what type of gas is elevated, right? So that will tailor what type of antibiotic therapy we can true, use. True. Yeah. Also, it will tell us, okay, is this something uh, that we're dealing with, right? So because if you, after, after you treat it, you don't know whether you had SIBO or not, right? And if your sy symptoms come back, then you have, uh, again, you can repeat the test to say that, okay, what's going on? Is the disease coming back or am I, uh, what, am, what am I treating here? So uh, it has all those advantages, but uh, again, I understand that at points that you don't have access to a breath testing or certain tests that you need to resort to a period testing. Um, anybody else has any comments on that? No, I mean, you, can't, you can give Rifaximin for IBSD. That, it's an approved drug for that purpose, but it has about a 44% chance of working. If the breath test is positive, it's 56. If the breath test is negative, it's 25. So the point is, if the breath test is, the problem is you don't know who you are. As soon as you give the Rifaximin, mm -hmm. you can't use breath tests because you don't know if you made it go away. You don't know if you had it. You don't know what's going on anymore. So if you don't do a breath test before and you take Rifaximin and you come back and the breath test is negative, you don't know if you had it or not. Uh, and so it's confusing if you don't start with a breath test. That's all I'm saying. As we start to move into the management, if you don't respond, what are we going to do next? Do we do this? Do we do that? And, and we get a little confused if you've taken the antibiotics without the breath test. I guess that leads to another question. So let's say I had SIBO, I did a round of uh, rifaximin, and how long do I have to wait before I retest uh, since you took the antibiotics? Do you have to wait a month or a couple of weeks? No, so it, it all depends on what symptoms you have. If, if you take the uh, rifaximin and you're asymptomatic, there's no need uh, to retest. What right? if you're still symptomatic? Uh, if you're symptomatic, then there is no timeline. You can repeat the test to see where you're at. There's no waiting period after you take the antibiotics? Uh, yeah, because you want to see why your symptoms are not going away. Yeah. Got it. Right. Great. That's it. Yeah. I, I have a question about the IBS smart test. Is that helpful for identifying emo? Uh, so I'll leave that to Dr. Pimentel. Right. Uh, so um, measuring the anti-vinculin and anti-CDTB antibodies, we found that if you combine the two, you get about 56% of IBSD patients will test positive. And remember in my lecture, I talked about 60% of IBS is caused by that mechanism. So that makes sense. 56% is right about there. Uh, in IBS-C, it's roughly 25%. So it's not as helpful and not as intimately related to the development of C. But in healthy people, it's about 10%. So even in C, there is an advantage to knowing it, but we generally don't find it as often and therefore may, may not be as cost effective. So we don't routinely do it unless we really have a history of somebody saying, look, I got sick. And, but, but in the D patients, we, we routinely do it because patients don't remember the first two days of diarrhea they had when, you know, they ate something off a food truck 15 years ago. So they don't remember, uh, and so we do it anyways because uh, 
the history is not as important. What was the name of that test again? Korea Smart Test? No, it's question about um, patients that complain about instantaneous gas the minute they eat. Is it previous food that hasn't digested or what causes that? Well, Gabby, Gabby, you should answer that because you did the analysis on the fermentation potential in SIBO, right? Yes, exactly. So when you have SIBO, like I showed, one of the tests that we do are trying to identify these microbes and what we usually see that these microbes produce a lot of gas, and they are very good in doing that. They're fast, right? So even if you eat food right now and that food reach to your small bowel, even at the duodenal level, it can already produce gas immediately. So E. coli can multiply every 10 minutes. So can you imagine how much gas it can produce in a time range of 30 minutes, 40 minutes? Right, so it's common to see that even if you eat more simple carbohydrate or sugar, you would produce gas immediately when the food reached the uh, small bowel. And, and in SIBO, uh, in the paper just published by Gabby as first author in, in August, there's a 63-fold higher potential of fermentation in a SIBO patient, 63 times higher than a normal person. So imagine, you know, two people eat sugar and you can produce it 63 times faster. That's 63 horsepower versus one horsepower. Um, it's a lot. I have a question about H. pylori. Um, why not tests? Why not um, a blood test for testing? Well, the end is gone. I can, I can oh, take that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I can take that uh, question. So, uh, the, if you have never been treated for H. pylori, or in the cases of uh, mouth lymphoma, uh, which is that uh, cancer that is associated with uh, H. pylori, we do rely on uh, blood tests. The problem with blood tests is that whether you have it or not, uh, if you have had it in the past and it's eradicated, it stays positive because these immunoglobulin stays uh, stay elevated. So to see the active infection, we use the stool test or the endoscopic testing or uh, the uh, breath test for that matter. So yeah, so that's, that's why. Um, I just have a question about the IBS SMART test. So if you've taken the test and you test positive for the antiviculin, um, but you no longer have the um, piece of it, should you retest later on after you've had rifaximin? Um, I mean, I don't know if that's something that goes away or they don't show up eventually. So if you get food poisoning, the CDTB antibody comes up first. And just like your COVID vaccine, if you never get another vaccination or you never get COVID, it goes down over time. So the CDTB will disappear but the vinculin keeps staying up because you have vinculin in your body. So you're gonna to continue to produce that antibody once you start. Rifaximin has nothing to do with the antibodies. It's related to the food poisoning. So if you get another food poisoning, the CDTB will go up again and the vinculin will go even higher than it was now. Uh, but we do see in some patients, and we're trying to look at this in a sample of about 400 that we've done, whether vinculin goes down over time very, very slowly, and, and we think it does, you just don't get food poisoning again. So that's another value of having the test is because if you're positive, you better be more cautious than anybody else when you travel because you don't want to get another case of food poisoning because it makes it the IBS harder to treat if those antibodies go higher, so. Okay, and another part to that then, so if you've had that positive test and you've also had a positive test for SIBO and then you've tested negative for SIBO but still have symptoms. Do you have thoughts on? Yeah, so, so this is the part that when, now that you've heard a bit of the story is easier to understand is that the vinculin antibody causes the motility to be poor flowing. That by itself causes some degree of symptoms. But when the overgrowth comes, the symptoms go. So you're normal here, you've got the antibody causing some poor flow, and those are symptoms, they, they associate with some symptoms. Then you get the bacterial overgrowth and it goes up here. The rifaximin gets it down to here, 
but we got to get rid of the antibodies. So when I when the title of the talk was a race to the cure, if we can get rid of the antibodies, we get people here, uh, and we haven't done that yet, and but we're working on it. Okay, um, and then as far as diet, um, adding in probiotics or fiber, I mean, is there any thoughts on keeping those to have your microbiome diverse? I'll you want to take it. Yeah. So. Um, I'll take on the uh, probiotics. So that's a, that's a uh, long conversation there. Because um, as you heard, for example, even in areas that it's a unibacterial phenomenon like C. diff, we still are struggling whether probiotics are helpful or not. So, and that's mostly because, remember, probiotics are not similar to medications that we know exactly how much of them are getting where, how much of them are alive, uh, the dosing is tricky, and uh, they're living organisms. They have different effects in different people, right? Uh, so in terms of irritable bowel syndrome, there are lots of data out there uh, to suggest that some probiotics may work, some probiotics may not work. Uh, but when we do a larger study, they usually they end up being not working, right? So that's the thing. So as of now, the guidelines and also our recommendation is that there is not enough data to recommend any probiotics, probiotics any uh, specifically for irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, but one thing that I wanted to bring up, uh, what is the ultimate mother of all probiotics? It's fecal transplantation, right? So it's essentially somebody's healthy microbiome with the prebiotics and you're putting in somebody else who's, uh, uh, who's sick, right? And even that, the response rates and results in IBS has been very uh, controversial and uh, contradicting, right? The study that came out of the US, FDA stopped it in the middle because it showed that uh, FMT was in fact inferior to placebo, so it was causing trouble. So actually, FDA stopped that trial. Study from De uh, Denmark also showed exactly the same thing. But then there is a study from Belgium that was positive and one from uh, Norway. So it's just uh, who gave the stool sample, who, who responds to it, we have no idea. And that just shows you that the, um, it's very uh, unlikely unless we go very specific and individualize with probiotics. It's very unlikely that a single probiotic will be helpful for all IPS patients. That's probably not going to happen. What was the second part of your question? Uh, probiotics? Fiber. OK, fiber. Um, so th the fiber is also, it can be a double-edged sword, right? So uh, the f if too much fiber, it uh, can cause a lot of bloating because uh, that's something that bacteria love. Uh, to uh, to break down. On the other hand, obviously, too little of a fiber is problematic for the movement of the gut, and that's something that you need to uh, balance in your diet. Yeah. Thank you. One one thing that didn't, in, in, and it's a different layer of methanogens that I think is really important um, is methanogens are associated with obesity and. and You've done a lot of that work. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and then and, and maybe COCA as well in terms of that, that data? Sure. So a number of years ago, um, we noted an association between people that had positive methane on their breath test and their weight. And we looked at that both in a population uh, that was uh, naive of surgery, and we also looked at it in a population of patients that had bariatric surgery. And in those that had had bariatric surgery, those that were methane positive actually lost weight um, less aggressively uh, than you would anticipate post-bariatric surgery. So from our group, we tend to think of methane as being associated with obesity. Um, it's interesting because there's a number of groups out there, including those uh, a few groups in Europe, that are showing that metha methane positivity, uh, or methane of Bergbatter smithia in particular, has been associated with anorexia, which is what Coco was talking about. So you get this U-shaped curve where it looks like the methanogens are high in people that have anorexia, and it also looks that it's high in, in obesity. And the question is that we think is whether or not there's an adaptive response. So if you have somebody who's starving, do they does their microbiome adapt to allow them to harvest more energy? And we know that methane slows the gut down and perhaps allows more time for that harvest to occur. So whether it's adaptive or whether it's something different, we use the term, you know, methane producers and methanobrevibacter smithii kind of uh, inter interspersed, but we don't really get down to the nitty gritty. We don't get down to the strain level. 
So perhaps, you know, with deeper sequencing and deeper analysis, the type of methane uh, producers that are associated with obesity and those that are associated with anorexia may actually be different, and we're looking into that. Yeah, I agree. I think the exact association is not yet very clear. There's this uh, publication that came out last year, December of 2022, by a group of, I think, uh, the authors are Dr. Hoganer and uh, based in Austria, that they have mentioned there are a couple of studies that show prevalence or presence of methane uh, producing archaea in the obesity population, while there are also other couple of studies that uh, show no association. So the exact uh, association, what the mechanism it is, and the you know what the relationship involved. It I think there there's still a lot more that we need to learn. Just a question on that: um, Have you found any correlation with rifaximin daily and any weight gain or fluctuation in weight? I uh, do you mean like taking chronic rifaximin and weight gain, or are you taking uh, acute rifaximin? Uh, chronic, so chronic a rifaximin. daily, like one dose daily. Uh, we don't see weight gain with that. We, but so I think what what we're what we're sort of thinking, and, and again, there's as they they both point out that there's more data to come, is that methane and some of these organisms are beneficial. So. Uh, when we talk about all the pathology and all the bad things that are happening, there's there's some there's always a yin and a yang to everything that's happening in the human body. So methanogens may be really great if you're in an environment where you don't get good uh, quality food. So sub-Saharan Africa is a very common place where methane and methanogens are in almost everybody. But the, the quantity and the quality of the food is different, and so they have to harvest energy from a, a, a different type of food. But then, coming here, you've got potato chips in the break room, bagels you know, every day, and all sorts of food, and you're nibbling all day, and all of a sudden the methanogens, which are really good at getting energy, 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 they are they're absorbing or providing you with more calories. So a person who has methane and a non-methane go to a restaurant, eat exactly the same meal, the person with methane is gonna get a few more calories every single meal compared to somebody else. That's sort of what we're, what we're thinking. But rifaximin, if it gets rid of the methane, we think you can actually have a reduction in weight. And I, and I think you know, you're going to see more data on that as we unpackage some of the stuff we're doing right now on elemental diet. What about some of those odd subgroups, smaller subgroups that we don't usually talk about, like people that have methane and constipation, but they happen to have high antibodies? Those well, people there, always a, feel a little left out. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of little subgroups. Um, there's the, the subgroup of methane people who are also hydrogen sulfide positive. So how do you treat those? And those do happen. When you see that, hydrogen sulfide causes diarrhea, methane causes constipation. The winner is always methane. So they will come in, they'll have constipation. You treat the methane, all of a sudden the hydrogen sulfide is there and they're going into a diarrhea phase. So that's why knowing all three gases, even in those small subsets, is important. Um, if, you, if you see on the graph, we, the majority of methane producers, we don't think came from food poisoning. But at the same time, food poisoning drives up hydrogen production in the gut because you get this E. coli and CLEB. And hydrogen's a source for methane. So occasionally, the food poisoning story fits into the methane story as well. But it's not as common as just the hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide story. I, I, I know there's no, a, a, a lot of words, but it, it, that's sort of what we're seeing. Yeah, that really will clarify a lot for a lot of patients. And elemental diet, there's a new one coming, Dr. Rosai? Uh, potentially, yes, as, uh, uh, so not potentially, it is coming, so hopefully we will have an announcement next week in Vancouver at American College of Gastroenterology. All right. Thank you so much for coming. We have a reception next door. Please do not leave. Please come. And um, you get to talk with all these fantastic, wonderful people and, um, and get to know each other a little bit more and just, you know, just kind of hang out. Don't forget your book. Everyone gets a free book that's been signed by both of the authors. It's been mentioned a few times during the day today, and I know that um, you will enjoy it. I thoroughly enjoyed reading it personally. So I believe that's it. And if you forget your nickname, use Rizai for your parking. <laughs>
much. <laughs> And that means that Ali has to pay full price, right? Exactly. Okay, exactly. so that works. Yeah.